Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are author Jerry Schur and actor Renee Rivera. Author, filmmaker, lecturer, professor Jerry Schur was born and raised in Fall River, Massachusetts. She earned her bachelor's at the University of Massachusetts and her MA in art education from Springfield College. She started as a teacher, went on to work in the transportation industry, then into screenwriting and directing, and now new, newly novelist with her book, The Twig Painter. Let's start at the beginning, Jerry. Um, why art? Um, what were you gonna do with your art? I knew when I was in the sixth grade that I wanted to be an artist. I just was drawing when I was a little girl, never stopped, and followed my heart, followed my career, went to school to study fine arts, but decided that I wanted to be a little bit practical, and so I wanted to get a teaching job and teach art. Oh, uh, so that's how, how that part came into it. So your career as an artist turned out to be a teacher and you taught abroad, you taught in colleges, you taught everywhere. I taught in Germany for a year when my husband was stationed there oh, and then I taught uh, I taught in junior high, high school, elementary, it was really wonderful and then when I got my master's degree Springfield College decided to hire me as a professor so I was actually teaching teachers how to teach art in the elementary school. Oh that's what that was, it was like a teacher workshop yes. in a way. That's fantastic and what process do you go through? teaching young children about art? Well, I find that it's very good to intertwine other uh, areas of study, whether it be English or mathematics or history, and honestly, some children can create better through a written, rather than reading or writing, they can just draw, you can find out a lot about their emotions. So to me, it was just a fascinating way for them to become themselves and to give of themselves, and I find that they become much more relaxed when they're doing art. Unfortunately, I don't know how much art is left in the schools today. Not very much. That's a pity, because um, once they start doing that for themselves, then they can feel free to put whatever they want on the paper, right, and use different kinds of materials, and then do you get into that part of it? Yes, mixed media is very important. I do cutouts with magazines, uh, <coughs> felt, feathers, buttons. I do it now with my grandchildren. Because they feel comfortable. Yeah, and they love the texture. <laughs> yeah. And now, and of course, I studied twig painting, which is dipping little balsa and bamboo wood sticks into India inks and applying on an illustration board. Well, will twig painting go into your book? Yes. Okay, so we'll get to that then. Okay, that was your inspiration. But, so you, you just take a twig and put it in paint or an ink or ink. an ink? I dip the wood into India ink and then apply it on like an illustration board. It gives a very fine, detailed oriented look. And then when the picture is finished with all the hues, I put a polymer coat solution on top. It, are you drawing something de descriptive? Is it? Uh, Usually. It, um, it is. I did a lot of photographs when I lived in Germany in Amberg and just Dossenheim and then I take those photographs and then draw and then oh, make pictures. Well. So, we finished your career <laughs> as a teacher. Then you went into business. How did you get into this business thing for so long? It was really a fluke, Joan. I was working at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts, uh, again, with, as a professor, and the school asked me to work in London for about six weeks uh, to take my students over there and be To like, go to London, did yes, you say? Yes, they wanted me to go to London, and my students were placed in work-study, and they wanted me to be the liaison for the school. So it was tough. I had two little tiny daughters at the time, but my ah. husband was very supportive and said, fine, go, it's a great opportunity. And that really changed my life. I realized that I loved being the spokesperson for the college. I was basically selling the college. And I, I changed my life. On the way home on the plane, I decided that's it, I'm gonna go into sales. And, and that's what happened? Yes. And then you got into sales and marketing and that creative part of it, right? 
Well, I had trouble at first answering all the ads <laughs> in the Boston Globe, like who's going to hire an art professor to be in sales, but I saw a little ad that said international freight specialist, and I thought, oh, I speak a few languages, I travel. Did you? Yeah. You spoke oh, German? I spoke a little German, I spoke Spanish, I spoke Hebrew, I figured, oh, I can get this job, not knowing it was about containerization and freight. Right, but I mean, just to answer something that like that, that just seems like the furthest thing away. It was, but you know, the karma, <laughs> the stars just lined up, and when I got there, the, the man, it was a minority company, this guy in New Jersey had this minority company, and he met me and said, oh, you'll really round out our minority, a Jewish female from suburbia. There were no females in the tr freight I industry. I know, my gosh, that's what I'm thinking, that was so fantastic. It was an amazing opportunity, and I was a fast learner, and I loved mathematics so doing the freight rates worked and by a year later everybody was like wanting to offer me better jobs from the industry because I was like the novelty I was the only woman did you take that creative end of it then yes in marketing is that what happened well I did I did I brought something to transportation that no one had before and I did parties and I had uh, <sighs> transportation parties and people would be driven in horse and buggies and then I'd have an ice cream truck truck drive up to give them to dessert. sell your containers or yes. to sell your business yes that's fabulous and what kind of an audience would you bring into something like that well I worked <coughs> with um, big companies Gillette and Raytheon and oh. digital and I did the freight negotiations for you know 12 million dollar freight budget so it was it was really fascinating and we would wine and dine these people you know <laughs> I had a, a 42 foot yacht at one point <laughs> Um, so it sounds fantastic, and this was some something that they had never done because, as you say, you think about freight, and it's just kind of uh, out there. And man with cigar, you know, fifty men in a room, and then me. I mean, it was totally. I was like, totally from somewhere another planet. I mean, it was. Did very you feel unusual. comfortable? At first, I was very intimidated because I was very young, and. I, I knew I knew what I was doing, but I didn't think they knew I was doing. Right. But I proved myself and I became better than anyone else. You know, I had the highest sales, I won diamond contests, so then I, they had to reckon with me. And do you think that all came out of your art education? No, I think it was a combination um, that I have a, a lot of business savvy. I have like right brain and left brain and I have very high Q to algebra and mathematics, and I was able oh. to do so many wild things with the freight rates. And could you do them in your mind and give them answers? So yes. they knew you were talking what you were talking yes, about. Yes, they knew that I, I was at the top of my game, and that I was also going to do what was right for the customer. I was very ethical. I see. You stayed there a long time. Well, I worked my way up the ladder to different companies. At the end, I worked for God Trucking, and it was kind of funny because I'd go to the receptionist and give her my card, and she'd call the traffic <laughs> manager and say. God's here, and it's a woman. And it's a woman, <laughs> yay! <laughs> and from there, you went into film. I did. I mean, that was a very big career because you became a member of the Directors Guild of America, the Alliance of Women's Directors, Independent Documentary uh, Association. So you must have been doing like fantastic work. How did you get into film? It was kind of interesting how it happened. I was at a trucking seminar and I met a guy who asked me to help him with a book about Germany because he knew I had lived there. And I offered to help him and then he said, oh, you know what, I'm going to write it as a screenplay instead of a novel because I just took a course with Sid Field and it's easier, I only have to do 100 pages. So he taught me a lot about screenwriting and said, I said, you know, I have always had an idea for a novel. And he said, don't write a book, write a screenplay. It's much easier. Oh, he did. I'll help you and I'll teach you. And so I invited him to my house and he came July 4th. This was many, many years Where ago. Where was that? Uh, this was, we were at a conference in Worcester. He came to my house in Marblehead. It was in, it was in Massachusetts. Yes. But he was from New Jersey, and I think he just came into my life to give me this information and then go out. Where was the trucking? The trucking was in Massachusetts, too? It was headquartered in New Jersey. Right, that's um, what you said. But then I had all of New England, so I worked oh, so you were, the New England states. I see. And opened the companies there. I opened many companies in New England. So, so I, here I worked, you are, you're going to write a screenplay. Yeah. I, I wrote, and what was your story? Which my, story was my it? My story is The Twig Painter. Oh, that was the story. Yes. But before you got to The Twig didn't you do uh, Live Life and 42nd Street Miracle and what? Yes. Mission to Matrimony and... I, I did many movies because people heard of me and I started figuring out why am I wanting to be on movie sets? Why am I writing this? So I apprenticed and I said, oh, I'll be so the So did you director. start the Twig per 
I started conceiving the idea and working on index cards many years ago. But then you started these other films. Then, then I worked on movie sets to try to I figure see. out why oh, I was doing it. you worked with them. Yes. So that, but, but then you started directing and as well. And then I started directing because I was a production manager, then I was an art yes. director, then I was a producer. I'd done everybody's job. This is typical of Jerry. Getting in and knowing how to do everything, it seems like. I just, or working. When you know not being everyone's, afraid. Yeah, when you know everyone's job, nobody can pull anything over on you. Yeah, and you're not afraid to get in there and do it. No, and I, and I always felt that the more experience I had on a set would be better for my own stories. And I worked uh. for two directors, and then after I did their movies for them, I said, I'm going to make my own movies. What am I doing? <laughs> and they said, you can't. You're a woman. You live oh, in Massachusetts. Did that again? Yeah, you live in Massachusetts. You never went to film school, so forget it. And I'm like, that's it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And that's when I directed my own. And did, is, was that 42nd Street Miracle? No, my first, uh, I did many movies before that to learn. Oh, I you call did. it my film school. I see. But 42nd Street Miracle was pretty interesting. Well, that was a, a case where uh, I met Will Lyman, who I'm sure you know because he's the narrator voice of the BMW commercials. And he was the protagonist in a film I was producing. Uh -huh. And he came to me and said, Let's, would you like to direct and produce this project I'm going to do in New York? He had sort of the inside scoop that something was going to move on 42nd Street. On 42nd Street. Street. And it sounds like the movie, Miracle on 42nd Street, but it's the other way around. And it was the rebuilding and closing of those... Uh, it was about the theaters and theaters. and I say it's from the 1930s to the present tracing the evolution of 42nd Street. I thought it was great. It was so interesting, so interesting. And so was the twig painter. Um, I know one of the inspirations, and I want to make sure we get this in, was your father. Mm -hmm. And he always wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And yes. you included something of his in the book. What was that? A letter he wrote to me when I was in college. Um, he always made me laugh. He wrote me these extraordinary letters. I mean, many, many pages, typed, beautiful. And it was an odd thing. He sort of turns up, even though he's not physically here, in, in many ways in my life. And I wanted to include that because he told me he wanted to write a book and he never had the opportunity of dying at 53. So I included it in the book. It, it kind of made sense for me. And then one of the other things that I thought was chapter 20, Marble, when you talk about Marblehead and the references to all the musicians, I mean, you're quoting Louis Armstrong oh, yes. and David Bowie and Cat Stevens. How did that well, come into your... I have these extraordinary daughters, two girls, and they made this, this, that tape for me for my anniversary, my 25th oh, anniversary. Oh, so that's when those... And when they gave it to my husband and I and we listened to it and it was playing, she took a slice of each one of these... It was so unbelievable. We just cried our eyes out. I mean, and we listened they to it. They were over great and over. songs, yeah. But then, and then the actual story of the Twig Painter is to try and get everyone together, right? It's to try to bring the information to the forefront so that scientists will share information. Believe it or not, my theory is actually happening in real life. And there is a doctor in Chicago, Dr. Sajato, a botanist, who is working on the twigs. And I've had many conversations with him to make sure that this is really going to happen. So they're working in Sarawak, Malaysia, with the wood and the sap from um, the Bintangar tree. And it's canalad A and canalad B. They're working on it. And they believe that actually um, it's going to be tested in humans soon. And there is 100% that kills the AIDS virus. But there's too much toxicity in it right now. So that's what they're working so they, on. So they have to clean that up? Yes. Sounds a little avatarish to me. Well, I hope that I'm on to something for real. I mean, I know it was fiction based on fact. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow someone gave me this information to give to the world. Yeah, and the other thing is people don't work together when they start d doing all this research, do they? No, because they have huge ego. They want it for themselves. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies do not want to get you know involved because they want to keep selling drugs, 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 more medicine. And here is the twig painter. She'll tell you all about it, right? It's, it's a fascinating story. Those people who have read it have told me they can't put it down. So that's the, that's the goal. And now everyone's like, where's the sequel? Where's Penny going to go next? <laughs> right. Thank you so much for coming, Jerry. Oh, you're welcome. It's such a pleasure. I, um, I'm also happy to say that 
Cedar Sinai Hospital. Oh, I know. Mention that has the book in their gift shop, um, which is great because it's about a cure for AIDS, and uh, also Traveler's Bookcase, which is this great little store in Third Street. I thought that the idea that Cedars was selling it was fantastic. So thank you again for remembering that. And don't go away. We'll be right back with actor Renee Rivera. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Actor, performer, Rene Rivera was born and raised in San Antonio, where he attended Incarnate Word College. You've seen him on Broadway, off-Broadway, and in theaters in Chicago, Miami, Boston, Portland, uh, and of course in Los Angeles. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen him on the screen and in films, but Renee studied acting with Kevin Klein, Marion Seldes, John Styx, and with Maureen uh, Halligan at the Juilliard School, where he was a theater major on a full scholarship. Renee has a long list of, as I said, TV and film credits, and you worked on stage with Al Pacino um, in Salome, mm -hmm. and it was here? Yes, at the Wadsworth. Theater. I saw it. It was fantastic. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, was it? How was that? Was that your first experience with him? No, no. Uh, we we had worked on on Salome, uh, uh, Al, and other other actors uh, at Circle in the Square. Oh, that came York. first. <laughs> yeah, and then um, we uh, we did it here um, several years later. Oh, it was many years later. Yeah. And it was so hard to get tickets. It was totally sold out. At Circle in the Square? No, at both. Oh, I at guess. both, yeah, yeah. yeah at Wadsworth, it was very yeah. difficult. Yeah. And that was a big theater. That's true. It's a very, very And big it was theater. mesmerizing. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it was, was fantastic. Yeah, it was brilliantly directed by Estelle Parsons. And uh, Estelle did the one here? Yeah, she did. She directed the one here. You know, I barely remember seeing Estelle at that time. Yeah. But you also made a film with with Al Pacino, Wild Salome. Did that come out of that? Yeah, it was, it, it was this, the, the film version is the one that, uh, that Al directed himself. And I see. It's basically a, a, a compilation of, of the rehearsals of, for the play and the performance oh. of the play and uh, his imagery of, of that play. So it's basically uh, a, a film version of everything combined together and it will definitely have his, uh, his brush stroke in it. Is it like a documentary in a way? It's, it's, it, will, it will have that, that, that uh, taste and feel to it, um, but I think in a much more uh, creative way at the same time. So he had to. So he was filming all the time. You were on stage in New York and in L.A. It wasn't in New York. We it was a totally different production, uh, even though it was oh, the it same was? play. Really, but it, it was a different production uh, in terms of the the cast and the crew and all that. Uh, but you were in both. I was. In, I was. I was fortunate enough to be in both. Yeah. Um, so he he uh, he he brilliantly directed. Um, the, the cast that was in, in the production at the Wadsworth Theater here in Los Angeles. So did you cast in each city? So you took people from here, from L.A.? And well, then Estelle, in New York you took the, 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 the production in, in New York um, was basically all New York actors. I, that's and the, the production here in Los Angeles, it was a combination of, of Los Angeles and, and New York actors. I see. Well, from reading your bio and knowing a little bit, bit about you, you actually like the classics. You like mm. Shakespeare, right? Yes. Hamlet, yeah. Hamlet directed by Kevin Klein. Yeah, we did that, yes, Hamlet uh, at, at, at the Public Theater. And also then you, As You Like It and mm -hmm. Macbeth mm -hmm. and... and uh, the Scottish was, play. The other, <laughs> the, the other one that uh, Estelle directed you in. Um, yes, Estelle directed uh, uh, three, three Shakespearean productions, the Romeo and Juliet, the Scottish play, um, which is, is the, the one you just mentioned a while ago, and, um, as, and, 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 and uh, as You Like It. We call it the Scottish play? Well, th there's <laughs> the, 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 you never mention 
the title of that play. Is that right? Yeah, because it's it's uh, it's sort of uh, peppered throughout with incantations of witchcraft, and it has a history of um, of, of accidents occurring and uh, to the person to the productions and to people that are in the production. But but when they did they did the opera, Macbeth. Uh huh. And they mentioned the name. Right. But, uh, but I, I've seen that where they say the Scottish play. I didn't realize yeah. that, that, that it's like a curse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, the reason that, that, that I'm, uh, I'm sounding a little adamant is because in both productions that I worked on, um, I, 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 uh, I, I experienced accidents. Oh, you really did? <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, let's uh, go away from that. Yeah, it's okay. Let's go away. But how can you plan something like that when you have that thing in the back of your mind? Well, you how know, at the act? time, at the time, I didn't know. Oh, so so it it frees you. Yes. I, I mean, you have to be free. That's right. You you do. And uh, and if you have this in the background yeah, of your mind. Yeah. No, at the time I didn't know, and and now that I do know, I don't think I'll ever be part of that production of that. Play. I was just going to ask you, would you ever do it again? No, I don't think so. Well, The Merchant of Venice was a favorite of Pacino, and you were directed by Peter Sellers, um, where in Chicago and London? Yes, yes. Uh, Peter Sellers uh, directed uh, the Merchant of Venice that I was a part of uh, at uh, the Goodman Theater in Chicago. Fantastic theater! Yeah, it's I a love wonderful, it. great, yeah. great theater. But but he was in the film, right, Pacino. He was in that film, The Merchant of Venice, but this yes. was on stage. Yes, yes. That, he, Al did do a, a, a The Merchant of Venice, uh, the film version of it, but uh, nothing to do with the production nothing. that I worked on in Chicago. And then Joan Acolytus. Joan Joanne, Acolytus, yes. Yeah, fantastic wonderful, director. Wonderful director. You did, what did you do, Henry IV with Henry IV, her? part one, part two, at, uh, again, at the Public Theater in How New York. How did you remember all of this dialogue? Um, hard, hard work. And um, diligence, and, and many hours of rehearsals, and, and uh, thinking about it, and, and, and how did you get so interested in it and so involved? Because it was a challenge, or because of it, you love the roles, or well, uh, to make a long story short, I, I think uh, I, that it was because there there was very little communication in, in my family oh. uh, when I was growing up, and uh, being. Uh, kind of a shy guy, you know. Uh, uh, everybody in my peop in my family were were kind of shy, and and uh, and then to boot, there was no communication, and there was this sort of strife in, in the house. Uh, Did they speak lot. Spanish? In and the we spoke Spanish, so I uh, my uh, my desire was to be able to communicate, and so such a difference, yeah. right? Such a yeah. such a turnabout. Mm. Well, let's talk about King of the Desert, since we're talking about Spanish in the family and the story of uh, your life. Tell us about King of the Desert. Well, it's uh, it's a it's a one person uh, a piece that that uh, Stacy Martino wrote, who is very close to my heart. Yes, how uh, close is she? She's, she's so close. She's in my heart. Did she, uh, did she write it before you were married or after? Um, after. Oh, she wrote it after, after. you were married. And uh, it, it was born from uh, her visiting my family and meeting my, my family and my parents and, and seeing where, where I grew up and all that. And she, she put together this wonderful long poem um, that is, is uh, real to my life. And also uh, there's some dramatic uh, textures that were added to it. So we're calling it a performance because it is a one. It's a it is a performance yeah. piece, yeah. That 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 uh, spans many years. So um, you worked with Stacy on two or three different things. Yes, we worked on the first thing that that I worked on with her uh, is a, a, another play that she wrote, a series of monologues uh, titled "The Gift of Peace" that we toured to seven different cities across the United States. So was it just a one person as well? No, that one was quite the opposite. Oh. There was about uh, seventeen or eighteen. Oh, a big uh, cast. Cast of uh, people in the and cast. And as you it. toured, did you pick up actors, or did the tour, the whole group go with you? <laughs> no, we 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 uh, you, all went together. You all went together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a big bus. yeah, a big band of actors. <laughs> No, well, that probably was kind of fun. It was fun. It was fun. And then what else did you do with her? Um, we, now we, after that we worked on uh, the documentary of the Gift of Peace, of the whole, oh. um, the whole uh, expedition, of the whole journey of traveling across the country. So it was country. a film then? It's a documentary, a film documentary. Oh, I see. That, that is still being worked on. So, so King of the Desert, which is 
a story about you, yeah. your family? Myself, my family, and myself, and, and my family in relation to each other, and, and, uh, and uh, there's uh, my brother also is a part of that, and, and his drug use, and, and uh, my uh, uh, living in San Antonio, and then uh, living in a fantasy world every day because uh, having to, to deal with my loneliness. And so uh, the little boy who, that I play, uh, is always getting in trouble because of his uh, um, creating these characters in the middle of the street and, and uh, he gets in trouble with his mother and his neighbors and uh, eventually ends up uh, auditioning for, for the Juilliard School in New York and he gets, he gets accepted. And that's where you went. And, and that's where I did go, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you see, you, basically the starting point is when the young child is six years old uh, to the point of being like uh, a, young, a young mature man in, in New York City. Do you play those roles, those age roles? And yeah. how do you do that? Yeah. Um, how do I do that? For a six-year-old. Well, costuming, lighting, no, no, it, no, voice? no. We have no props, no, no, props. no props, no costume changes. Basically, what I'm wearing is what I will be wearing for the play. I just came from a from a run through. So, and and your director Valentino Valentino Ferreira. Ferreira. Uh, yeah, Ferreira. How does he direct somebody who didn't live the life? It seems like you'd be better directing yourself. Oh this wow, was your life. that's a very, uh, very astute question. Um, I think because the play, is, well, first of all, he's a fabulous director, uh, extremely sensitive and uh, and and considerate and, and extremely creative and imaginative, and um, it is also a very universal story. It, it it's it I think covers all. it covers everybody. He, just because it deals with specifically him and he talks and and we we express how and where he comes from, being uh, Mexican American and all. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, in truth, it, it's everyone's. It story It could be as any well. any immigrant family. Any any person exactly. Any, right. Yeah. It's at the El Centro Theater, mm -hmm. and it opens Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. Why? Yeah. Why? <laughs> was that planned? Um, it, it was. It was not. It was not like planned. It just sort of <laughs> fell on our lap. It did. Um, but but once we realized that that we could open the play on Cinco de Mayo, uh, we thought that it was appropriate because. Because it is a it, it's a it's a holiday that's highly uh, known in the United States, and it's connotated towards uh, Mexican uh, liberation, Mexican independence, perhaps. But uh, it, in truth, the, the Cinco de Mayo is not uh, Mexico's Independence Day. Um, oh, that's but, funny. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's interesting. But but it, it is. I think Cinco de Mayo is celebrated as 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 uh, celebrating the identity of Mexico. That's and, what I always think of yeah. too. And so I feel we felt that uh, that uh, presenting uh, the initial production of this of the initial performance of this production would be appropriate on, on Cinco de Mayo for that specific reason. I think it 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 sounds like it is. And before we go, I do do want to mention that you are a lifetime member of the Actors Studio, mm -hmm. which is very prestigious. And I thank you so much for being oh, with us today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's very kind of you and, and, and your staff. We will look forward to your performance. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. And don't go away. Keep writing to us at 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. And you can email J A Q U I N N at A O 1, sorry, Q U I N N 1 at AOL.com. See you next time.